Paul, how are you doing, my friend? Hi, Rich. Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Very good. You look like you, you're stuck in the bush there. I love the background you've chosen. I'm, I'm feeling a little trapped up in my, in my South African quarantine at the moment. So we just live with what is. Um, yeah, bad luck. Yeah, so it happens. So it happens. Guys, this is Paul Joynson Hicks. He's a professional wildlife photographer who's been doing wildlife photography for a long time, but started off in a different sense. So we'll get into that just now. He guides through Kenya and Tanzania doing photo safaris. And I'm really excited to have you here, Paul. I love your images and I love your work. And I'm really excited to talk a bit of photography with you today. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for having me. It's, it's exciting. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So let's go, go straight into it because you were explaining to me earlier how you got into photography and, and your route into wildlife photography. And I'd just love for you to, to go through that in a bit more detail for me, please. Okay, so um, I started off uh, in the early 90s as uh, as a photographer in London and yeah. uh, I, I did some fashion photography and some music photography and some portrait photography and then uh, I got an opportunity to go to Uganda um, to to do some photography there and uh, I tried to find a I tried to find a book on Uganda on my way out but I failed to find one so I thought well why don't, I'm a photographer why don't I go back so I'd had a great time there why don't I go back and uh, and and do a book. Anyway, I managed to find a publisher, and and so I went back. I did a book on Uganda, and then and that was it. Really, never left Africa since then. That was ninety three. Yeah, it's amazing how that African bug bites hard. Once you, once it gets its talons <laughs> in you, it doesn't let go. But Uganda it itself is just such a spe special country on its own. The people are just magnificent. I really love going there. What was your what was your feeling when you went there? I mean, that's a long time ago. I only recently started going there about six years ago. So I would love to yeah. know what it was like back then. I mean, it was, I mean, it was an extraordinary place back then, I think, because they'd only been out of war for, what was it, seven, six or seven years. You know, they suffered so much for such a long time. And then and in, the, in the 80s, 90s, they were being ravaged by HIV AIDS as well as uh, as well as, um, you know, the sort of psychological traumas of all the wars. So yes. but despite all that, they were just amazing, amazing people, amazing people. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, definitely. And um, so as a, I mean, now you went from this commercial side of photography in the big smoke of, of London, all the way yeah. through now to big wide open spaces of Africa. And you've now developed into a photographic guide. Do you enjoy that side of things? I mean, what, what do you think makes up a good uh, photographic guide? What would, you, what would, you, what would your uh, advice be to anyone that is in wildlife photography that would like to go that route? I mean, I think, I think the industry has changed so much over the last 15 years, you know, since digitization has come on board. Because as a wildlife photographer, you know, I think 15, 20 years ago, we're, we're all making our money through... Um, uh, we're all making our money through uh, through selling images through stock, whereas you know since the digital digitalization world's come out, um, you know we're not getting much money from stock at all. I mean, I don't know if you have the same thing, but my my stock sales have you know plummeted over the last ten years, fifteen years, and so and so one of the ways that that we can make make money, those of us who aren't uh, working with Nat Geo or, you know, those the the bigger magazines is uh, is yeah. by guiding and and yeah. I think what I love about that is that you uh, you know you you get to be out in the bush. Someone's paying you to be out in the bush, but also you're not on your own. And I think and I think probably this is why I'd never make a very good National Geographic photographer because you know I love <laughs> being with other people and mucking about and I love the stories around the campfire. And also, it's so much fun uh, sharing your love of photography and the bush together and, totally. and seeing people's photography improve over the, the, the week or two weeks or however long it is. It's, it's a lot of fun doing that. Um, and so I think, I think one of the problems with, I think so one of the key things about being a wildlife photographer guide is that 
your images are the least important aspect of what you're doing. And I think, totally. I think sometimes you find, you find these amazing photographers, wildlife photographers, and they, they take people on safari, but they're so you know, focused on their photography, on their work, that maybe sometimes they can forget about their clients who, who yes. are standing there going, how do I photograph the lion on a tree? Um, or something like that, or a leopard in a bush or whatever it is. You know, um, what is an f-stop? How, you know, you know, how does composition work? Or how do I get a blurry background? You know, all those questions. And you're there to enable them, you know, to get the great picture. And I think that's the, that's the key. I think as long as you know that your pictures are the least important thing and everyone gets their pictures first, and then you can take your pictures because they want to see your pictures. And also because of the digital world, you can, you know, if you park up next to a, a lion on a rock, everyone's taking pictures, snap, snap, snap. Maybe you're helping someone and then you take a picture and then you can show the person, you know, Dorothy, who's, who's uh, photographed actually the bush next to the lion. And you can sort of try and, you know, aim her camera at the yeah. lion or whatever, you know, and it, uh, it's, uh, it, it's really good fun. It's just fun. I, I, I totally off as a, as another guide. I I would like to know where you like to sit in the vehicle. When you're in the vehicle, do you like to be in the front or towards the back so you can see what's going on with the people's cameras? I, yeah, that's it's always been an interesting. I I like both places, but mostly to be with the guests. But I'd yeah. love to know where you where you like to be positioned in a vehicle. It's a, it's a conundrum because because. You know, part of me wants to be at the front because uh, because I'm I'm speaking Swahili, I'm chatting with the guide, I'm making sure quietly we're getting ourselves in the right position for the sighting, or that we're discussing where the three vehicles of the convoy are going to be positioned, or will we stop under this tree for us for a picnic breakfast or what? And they, and it's nice and quiet, doesn't disturb the guests. Um, and then you can always access the guests by turning around and stuff. But at the same time, like you, that it's a conundrum because you want to be, uh, you want to be with the guests looking at their pictures. It kind of, for me, it depends on how many people are in the car. So if yeah. there's, you know, these these big safari vehicles that we have in East Africa, they're often three rows, and everyone has to have a row of seats to themselves, uh, yeah. you know, on a photo safari. So, so if there's three rows and I've got three guests, then I sit in the front. And then sometimes, yes. depending on the guest, I'll sit next to a guest if they if they want or more if they want more attention or if they need it or whatever. Um, and then if I've got one guest, you know, I I do a lot of private safaris, so yeah. if I've got one guest, then we're in the back of the car together, and it's great. Or the same same if I've got two guests, exactly, exactly the same. Exactly, exactly. So I don't and, think that answers and, your question at all. <laughs> no, it, it, no, it does. It does because you know I think. When people get in a safari vehicle, and in Southern Africa, we have the modified Land Rovers. So, um, sorry, there's just a question here. Okay, I'll go into that. <laughs> but, um, it's what, a good question. Yeah, it is a great question. The, the seating for us is always raised. So you have these different levels, which obviously changes photographic perception. And for me, it changes a lot of things and people always go, no, but you've got to be low. And yes, that is a big, big question. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to pop into a photo here of you oh. lying down with wild dogs. I mean, yeah, that's, that's the dream right there is position is the one on one on the ground, shooting up at something and you can be that close. Uh, maybe even with a longer lens, you want to be a bit further away because, or you're telling them to shoot so you can get the whole thing in the frame. But yeah, I also feel like the higher you go, sometimes I know in East Africa, we've got vehicles that you pop the, the hood and you're then shooting from the top down. All of that changes the, the feel of a photo. So if people fight often over which seat, but I just like people to know that there's different places you can sit and different places you can be in order to get great photographs. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, um, and those, those, are, those are great. Those open cars are great. We have some in some areas here, but uh, especially in Kenya and the Mara, but um, but the so what what I tend to do is um, the front seat in those open cars is the best one. But quite often yeah. you've got guests who've got a big bag of kit and it doesn't fit between you and the driver. So the first row is obviously the best as far as they're concerned. So 
you know, you just rotate people around and, uh, and I sit in the front usually or in the right at the very back, depending on, uh, on sort of how people are in agile and getting into the back seat. Exactly. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change a little bit. Okay, we're gonna go back to that question that we had just now from Alex, where he was asking us, how did you guys fund your trips to the bush before you became wildlife, before you became photographic guides? So you can lead with that. Oh, I'm, oh. I'm well, a, I mean, most of my, I can, I'm not sure I can say this on a, on a family show. <laughs> 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 no, okay. Um, so books, uh, uh, books, magazine articles, selling stock images. I mean, don't forget that I was, I was doing it. Um, longer time ago, I suppose. Um, that was one way of funding it, uh, but never hugely lucrative. Um, yeah. And I've always done, you know, I've always done a bit of commercial travel photography, sort of lodges and camps. Um, and nowadays, uh, nowadays selling prints probably as well, apart from the guiding is another way of, um, funding trips. Yeah. But it's, uh, well, I think anyone thinking of getting into this business and making loads of money, you know, there's, there's a handful of national geographic photographers. There's a handful of David Yarrow's, you know, around who are making loads and loads, but, um, most of us, <laughs> most of us, uh, um, you know, do it for love and being in the bush and, you know, wanting to do what we love doing. I think that's the, yeah. that's the dream, isn't it? Well, I, I think, and, and that's, that's something that I think this current crisis that we're going through in the world is also going to sort of push people to understand that work is not just about doing stuff for money. At the moment, money is a lot of things, <laughs> but your joy in life is more important yeah. right now than, than that side of things. So, um, uh, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, definitely, so that, that, definitely playing that cricket is, as well. Yeah. Is, a, <laughs> is a big part of the whole thing. All right. I want to jump to some other stuff. Now, one of the things that I, I, I really want to go visit East Africa. I had my first trip joint, um, done for this year that I was going to be part of. And unfortunately it's now been canceled because of all of this. So it yeah. goes. But one of the things is all of the silhouette photography. I mean, tell me, tell me about like, are there specific times of the year where there's more dust that gives you this coloration or clouds that come in at different times? Or is it a year round, get ready for beauty kind of thing? Yeah. Um, oh, good question, Sid. Come to that in a sec. Um, but the silhouettes, it's, it's, um, that, is, uh, that is just, that is light. That's just purely about light. So, you know, if, uh, you know, if the light is right, and I mean, this silhouette shot that I love from the Mara, you know, that's got clouds. That was probably, uh, I think, you know, no, I think that was actually in the dry season, but in the, in the rainy season and the dry season in between, you know, you get all these different weathers, you get amazing sunrises, sunsets that just produce fabulous, fabulous silhouettes. And, uh, yes. Uh, it's any it's any time you know you can have a silhouette by sticking your cat in front of a light bulb yes oh, totally that's a line. Okay, that line that line unfortunately <laughs> my head is in the way it's, so it's, your head. Be, it's a great bum of a lion guys it is an incredible photo i'm just my ugly mug is in the wrong place so let's just have a look at that elephant one is also pretty incredible i just wish i could move myself out of the way of this image yeah but i can't there's a bunch so, of elephants underneath you yeah yeah exactly oh, that, and madhu's question there when can we plan our next safari that's also an excellent question madhu I'm really in touch. <laughs> yes exactly exactly click follow and then send right. direct messages exactly exactly um, exactly all right, and there were some questions about photo techniques. While we're going back, I want to go back to a bit about the migration. There's an image you sent through to me, this one. Oh my goodness gracious me, what a freaking image. Was that from a, from a balloon? Uh, that was actually from a husky, a very small. Okay. I mean, it's rather like flying in a, in a, in a very tiny, yeah, it's a, it's a two-seater plane. You sit behind yes. the pilot and it's the Frankfurt Zoological Society with thanks to them, of course, um, they took me on one of their uh, anti-poaching observation flights. 
and uh, and it was just very fortuitous that the migration was there. And it's, I mean, it's really, really, really difficult to photograph the migration because you know you see that if you see that sight from the ground, you yes. know, because that part of the central Serengeti and southern Serengeti is really flat, you you hardly see anything. So so you need to see it from the air, but you obviously but it's it's rare. The capture that you that you've created there, you can see the motion of where they're moving to. You, mm. the the story you've told in that is just magnificent. I really that took my breath away. Really, really took my breath away. I, I love Yay, it. It's thank you. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. And obviously, crossings are a big part of it. I'm just mm. trying to find that one that you took of. Sorry, the photos get a bit jumbled. There we go. With the zebra and the wildebeest crossing, I love the way you've blurred the top end there. But these crossings are obviously often very chaotic. And, and one of the guys asked the question about your favorite photographic technique. And we're going to go into a bit of that with the panning and the higgle. Um, yeah. But I know that that motion, that chaos has created a lot with some slow shutter speeds when things are coming across. What would you say about that and, and, and so, capturing? Yeah. So, I mean, this, this particular, particular crossing was a, is a really, as you can see, it's a really small, very delicate crossing. It was on a beautiful, it was actually on a Nathab trip in the Mara and it was in the old Derekesi Conservancy and it was just, it was just us, which was just really amazing. amazing. Just crossing that very little bit of river. Um, and, uh, uh, but sorry, the question was about capturing movement. Yes. Or, so, or enhancing it. I mean, what would you what would you say is a good way to to focus on that? Because there's so much chaos going on. How do you capture a scene that that that's that big and that chaotic? If it's one line yeah. or a couple of lines, that's cool. But when there's ten thousand things trying to cross, I mean, I think one of my mantras, you know, that I say to myself when I'm photographing, you know, a big scene like that, or when I'm, you know, when I'm chatting to guests is that there's always more than one way to photograph something. So before, you know, as you approach a river crossing, I'll make sure that everyone's got a sort of a medium zoom or a slightly wide, wider zoom lens and then a, and a yeah. big close up. Because, you know, I think probably you've got two ways. And, uh, and, and the problem with something like a crossing is, is you could have waited many hours for it to happen. And then it's happening and it's going to last two minutes, you know, maybe a few more minutes than that. I mean, it depends. And, and so it's a, it can be a bit panicky. So we're telling everyone to relax, enjoy, and then, and then to, to think about how you want to photograph it. What, what story do you want to portray from your images? And it may be, you know, there's different things when you, when you, you see a river crossing, it could be the, the splashing and the chaos and the, the, yes. the bodies and the, and the intensity of it, in which case, if that's your story, then you've picked up your long lens and you're focusing yeah. in really tight and you're getting the splashing. Maybe try some slower speed to, you know, blur the movement, blur the yeah. action. You know, alternatively, you can look at this. You can pull back a little bit, get a bit more of the scene, you know, where, you, you know, you're looking at it like that. And, you know, you could even do it a bit wider uh, where, you know, that scene, for example, that you've got on the, on the camera there, if you yes. were to go about, an inch higher, you would have seen a line of vehicles all very irritatingly oh, wow. off the road and, and blocking our picture. Um, so, so it's basically, it's, it's a matter of um, choosing what story you want when you see the picture, because you could go all National Geographic and get the whole picture with the river, the crossing, and then the line of vehicles and talk about yeah. overcrowding and conservation dilemmas and things like that. Yeah. Well, it is, is one of those things. And then I, I see you love a bit of uh, monochrome Hi, in your life. Oh, one of my all-time favorite pickies. It is beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm just going to pop this up for those who joined late. This is, yeah. this is how you get images of that sort of proportion. is lying down on the ground and getting right in there. I love it. Awesome. So tell me about your, your monochrome. When you're taking monochrome to you, do you automatically go, okay, today I'm shooting monochrome or this image is specifically one that I'm going to do monochrome or do you get to post-production and go, that is one that I need to try in black and white and then work it like that? Yeah. Um, 
So I, I think there's two things. I think one would be uh, certain times of day. So I know that if it's after that beautiful golden hours of the morning or the late evening, or if it's a bit cloudy and gloomy and quite a diffuse light, but quite flat white light, yeah. then I'm thinking to myself, I'm pretty much shooting for black and white. And also you see, I've got a slightly different mentality because I grew up shooting film. Um, yes. In fact, with, with my mate, Rob, who just joined. Hi, Rob. Um, <laughs> and we grew up shooting film together you know, at uh, photo college and then, you know, through, you know, through all these other different things. And, and so I had to pick a camera with my, the black and white film in. So I knew that, I knew what I was going to shoot. Ah, oh, I love that one. Yeah, uh, well. Rob and was actually just talking about it right there with the drags exposed with the drag shutter. So I had to pop one up for him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, carry on with your, your, your um, thing. So having so having having had a having shot with film or color, I'd have two bodies. One body would have uh, you know a Fuji Velvia or Provia. Another body would have uh, XP4 or something like that. And um, and uh, and so now it's sort of the same. I'll shoot something, and then I'll think, do you know what the that's yelling out to me, black and white. And, and yes. it's quite likely. And it's the other thing is, is that it's a great trick to have up your sleeve to teach people if they're, uh, when, it's, when it's rubbish light, you know, um, people say, oh, I'm gonna put my camera down, you know, that it's yeah. not beautiful light and everything. But actually, you know, you can, uh, you, can, you can shoot amazing things in black and white when the light's rubbish. So, so, it's, so I tend to, yeah, predestine, predestine yeah. my black and white shooting, I think. And then, and then, obviously, I mean, these rainstorms, these little squalls coming through the Serengeti and the Mara. I mean, that's just classic, black and white, yeah. one on one. I could see Absolutely. that blown up massive on a on a wall. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Contact so, me for limited edition prints. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> How are we funding our lifestyle? We're selling prints now. We're not guiding. Um, uh, there was also a question by Alex asking, do you, so again, do you shoot in black and white on the camera uh, or do you do it in post-production, all in post-production? All in post-production. There's absolutely need. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Um, uh, uh, no, there's no need to shoot in black and white because there's, there's various things about that. The two, two main things. One is, it's another setting that you don't need to twiddle with on your camera. And that's something I'm always talking to people about when we're yeah. um <laughs> yes um yeah. that's something i'm always trying to talk to people about uh when i'm on safari is you know the less things that you have to twiddle with on your camera the better so you don't need to worry about that because you can always do it in post-production exactly the same way you know with a probably a better effect uh in post you know in lightroom and uh yeah. and the other thing is maybe you'll change your mind and if you change yeah. your mind and you've shot it in black and white, well, that's bad luck. Paul is the, the, the other thing that has to be remembered for anyone listening is that when you're shooting raw, it doesn't matter if you're shooting in black and white on the camera because it's still going to come up as color. So it actually makes no difference. You might as well shoot in color with the thought yeah. process and just make sure that everything's within, within bounds and reasons. I see Rob was asking about, do you have any... Do you miss shooting specific films or are you able to recreate this in computer? Well, uh, was that Rob? Yes, it was Rob. Okay, Rob, um, that's a really good question. So I think there's two things. One is, yeah, secretly every time I look at my pictures on the computer, it's not the same as when I bent over Lightbox with a loop looking at a, looking at a, uh, looking at a Fuji Velvia slide that was sort of pin sharp and, and saturated in color. And it, was, and it was pure, there was a purity about it, which, you know, you have to be a real fundy on your computer to, to try and work that out on, uh, uh, you know, nowadays. And, and I think, yeah, so I miss, I miss the results of, uh, of the color transparencies um, the black and whites, you know, because you can still get amazing 
black and white prints from your black and white images. It's not quite the same, but it's, it's still, you know, you blow up a picture huge. It still looks amazing. So, um, so I think it's the color that I miss. Uh, and, um, that's, and that's always such a difficult thing I find with post-production is the understanding of how much color you can and can't put in to keep it looking yes. natural yes. without blowing things out or, or making it feel unnatural. Where with film, it always was what it was. You know, it, yeah. it was far, far closer to the, to the true side of things. But having, I'm just I'm said, going through this. One, very, one through last this. thing on that. Um, yeah. Um, Richard, is that having said that is is also, I love the, <laughs> you put your head where mine is, that's great. Uh, I, just, I, that's just, I, I just wanted to look um, like you for a while. I forgot what it looks like yeah, right. behind, the, um, behind the nickel. The, uh, um, yeah, so, but having said that, I, lo I, I mean, I love shooting on film. It was very, it was much more difficult than shooting on uh, digital, but um, I think the, uh, the the immediacy of digital just makes life very very convenient and it's great fun and um, and it's lovely for sharing and it's way 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 better for teaching and that, yeah. I think that's what I love and you can see people's images get so better so quickly every day Absolutely. every day every day when you're on Safari and that's what I love about the digital thing totally all right so we're gonna go back again to our the shooting technique so you've got some incredible panning shots out of this cheetah is just the emotion the movement the chaos the yeah i just i just know something's about to get eaten on the other end um so i i want you to explain a little bit what you're thinking about when you're doing um any panning photography um and then there are also ones called the hickle technique which i would imagine this is one of those if i'm not mistaken <laughs> And um, if you can just discuss it, because I was saying to you earlier, I've never heard of the Hegel technique. I'm just uh, showing my novice nature in photography right now. So please enlighten us. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, sorry, just one thing. Pooch, can you call Bubbly, please? <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway, um, so panning. Um, uh, so the, the the thing is is that is that this this I love this uh, cheetah pig and it's you know it's the key element of that of that animal is its pace and you know a picture of it running when it's sharp you capture the the muscle movement and the action is is fabulous um, but here you get a real feel of the movement and then, and and it's just a longer shutter speed so you know at um, you're looking at you know, 20th of a second with a cheetah running, something like that. Um, wow. 20th of a second. And, and you just keep panning with the, with the animal and probably shooting quite a lot of pictures, click, 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 as you move. But you keep the animals in the center of, uh, you keep the animals in the center of the, of the frame and you get this blurred movement. And depending on how fast the creature is moving or walking or running, there's another cheetah pick I've got where the, where the cheetah is actually just, walking and so then your shutter speed goes maybe down to a tenth of a second yes uh chasing the wildebeest because they're moving fast so it may be around 60th of a second something like that yeah I, and that's that's the that's the thing is always trying to get that and, and it's a it's a really like a one in a thousand shot that you're when you're taking those shots you're expecting to get a whole bunch that you're not going to get right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, that's a great thing. So explain to me a little bit more about this Higgle technique. This would also be, was this, no, that was just straight on. What, uh, that's sort of higgling, Higgle. but the, yes. the elephant picture was a definite Higgle. And I don't know if you got the giraffe one, but so, so the idea Higgle, it was, um, is that, you take panning sort of one step further and all you're doing is just vibrating the camera, just vibrating the camera like that. You're shooting with the slow shutter speed, but you just wiggle the camera like that. And, then, and then you just see most of the time your pictures are terrible, but sometimes you get these really sort of creative, really dynamic pictures and it's, and you yeah. can't say it's luck because, you know, you've been trying to do it. Um, yes. You know, so, so it's, uh, 
yeah, it's just fabulous. And, uh, and it's called the Higgle. It's rather immodest, but uh, a, a friend of mine who's another wildlife photographer guide, Simon Stafford, and yes. uh, he, we were guiding a trip together and I was talking about this with the guests. And so he called it the Hicks Jiggle <laughs> because he'd also <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> That's amazing. So heard I love it. Here. The Hicks yeah, Jiggle, yeah. the Higgle. Yeah, the Higgle. I love that. Absolutely love that. Um, and then, I mean, obviously the emotive part of it, it's people often get lost in the, uh, the rules of photography that everything has to be sharp, yeah. everything has to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. People forget yeah. the idea that it's art. You're painting with light. And this image for me speaks a lot about, again, wild dogs, wildebeest, having been in a situation like that mm. where you, I can feel that emotion just because of the slower shutter speeds, because of the chaos that's caused behind it. And it is all just about that, the emotive part and, and teaching people that not everything has to stay within a box. No, totally. And I think, I think you know, the, the, I think spreading one's photographic uh, horizons is so important, especially if you're in that lucky position to be instructing people or coaching people in photography. You know, there, you know, there's so many boundaries that are put in on photography by, you know, the textbooks, if you like, you know, it has to be sharp, has to be correctly exposed, but actually, you know, that, you know, just muck about, explore with these long exposures or, you know, things like that. And, and, it, and, it, and it can have very fun and uh, dynamic results. Totally, 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 totally. Right. Next thing I, wanna, I want you to talk about to me is the Comedy Wildlife uh, Photography Awards. Now, I've, I've spent the last few years giggling at these photographs because they do tend to find a good mainstream to roll through afterwards. And I want to know why you started that, what, where you came up with the idea, what's the purpose behind those photographic awards? Okay, so, so, um, so I was thinking a few years ago, it was 2014, 15, something like that. We started, we started, I did, I ran it first in 2015. And, um, and it, it was, the idea was to, you know, tap into that, fabulous resource of photo competitions and yeah. um and there wasn't one and i think it was inspired by the fact that um you know i had an exhibition you know a couple of years before and it was my funny pictures you know which was sort of printed up not very big and they always sold first and always very quickly and that's always <laughs> very annoying rather than your huge yeah. canvas of the arty one but anyway the the, the the comedy ones always sold quickly so it obviously has a lot of it attraction for people so i thought well let's do that and I, and and really i think it was an it was the the whole idea behind it um um the whole idea behind it is that is uh, a vessel by which to try and sell a conservation message i guess yes. so attract lots of attention and you know over the last few di few years we've attracted a lot of attention over the media when our pictures come out and, you know, we're trying to trying to engage people about, you know, a positive conservation message. And I think one of the things that makes me really, really sad is that all the conservation stories are obviously sad ones. Butchered rhinos, yeah. butchered elephants, you know, poaching on the increase, so on and so forth. And, and we have to have that. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We have to have it. But it's just a shame. It had been a shame. But now there's more and more things coming out like... The Comedy Wildlife Photography Awards, but also like Remembering Wildlife book series, yes. which you'll have yep. seen. You know, this Thank is positive you. conservation. And we just need more and more positive conservation stories, messages, things out there. Because, you know, people will engage with us because our, our pictures at Comedy Wildlife make people laugh. And so that makes it, it you know, makes them happy, excited. It makes them uh, energized. And yes. so Talk. and energetic people are people who are going to do something or are going to be active. Whereas, yes. you know, you see another picture of a dead rhino, you're going to think, oh, no, I can't yeah. I, I go outside and shoot myself rather than dash and, and, also, and, and I also think that the, the, the positivity of, of the posts, people posting funny pictures like that, people are more yeah. likely to share your images and, and get it out to the rest of the world if they, if they do have a happy part, part to it. The negative side, there's a lot of people that will share it, but it's not as powerful as the happy side of things and the, the fun side yeah. of things. Yeah, exactly. Totally. Exactly. Um, okay, and then in terms of sightings, 
in the last, you sent me some pictures of some pretty cool stuff. Tell me about this, uh, this day that you had. Sorry, I'm just trying to find this animal because it's hidden. Aha. Uh -huh. This day. This day. This day. Ah. Uh, okay. So, so this was an amazing safari. It was my last safari of the year. Um, I hope that is not what I'm saying come December. But um, if it is, then I'm going to have to take up some other job. Um, yes. Anyway, the... Uh, uh, so day one, we land in central Serengeti. Uh, we've got two vehicles of people on a, on a Nathab safari. And we're driving along. Doo -doo 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 -doo, and, um, you know, an hour from the airport, we see a leopard in a tree. Lovely. Fabulous. It was far away, but we saw it. Really nice. And then we drive another few hours. And we, we're coming close to camp uh, in the uh, late afternoon. And Kabao, we saw this amazing caracal. And, uh, and it was so chill, just hanging out on this rock. We drove right up to the bottom of the rock, on the road, obviously. And, uh, and it was just so chilled. And it was our two cars just there for ages, out in the, in the eastern Serengeti. And it was just amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah, Any caracal sighting. Well, I've never, I've never seen a caracal, and I'm dying to see a caracal. And to see one sitting on a rock like that with a light coming through so beautiful, I mean, come on. That's I like... Know. The heavens open and the angels start singing their choir of joy. Exactly. And it's, it's always a bit of a bummer almost to have that happen on day one because you've set the bar so high. You're never, ever <laughs> exactly. going to do better. Exactly. Exactly. And then the next day you, you bumped into this guy, a melanistic serval. I mean, that is unreal. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, these these were the luckiest guests on the entire planet because yeah. how do you get a caracal on day one and then a melanistic serval on day two? So uh, yeah, we were super duper lucky with that. Um, that crazy. was just two days, and in fact, the next day we saw a leopard on a rock with two cubs, two little three-month-old cubs. So uh, <laughs> somebody was carrying Mooty with him. There's no yeah. doubt in my mind. Yeah, yeah. no, no. And we only got stuck once on that safari. So the luck just stuck. <laughs> it's unreal. All right, there's, a, there's another question that Robert asked earlier about what do you prefer, mirrorless or DSLR? Oh, I'm a DSLR man through and through, through 100%. So, um, so I, uh, I shot with Nikon F5s in the film days. Yeah. And yes. they're big, strong, heavy, fantastic cameras. Now I shoot with the D5s, and, yeah. uh, and likewise, they're just fantastic. They're really, really strong. They're super fast. The batteries last forever. Um, resolutions, everything I need. Um, you know, and, and so, uh, yeah, it, I, I'm definitely a DSLR man. I, not to say that, um, not to say that, uh, that uh, mirrorless aren't good. I mean, I have a little Fuji XT. 100 i think for my yeah. uh 18 to 50 zoom that i don't really use very much but it's very handy because it's small and light and we're always having to reduce our weight at the moment weight, exactly. yeah so mirrorless are getting better and better and they are slowly but surely taking over the world i think yeah yeah i've exactly. i've recently changed over to the sony's and i tell you what i'm i'm very happy to have left my neck on in the background the yeah. these new kids yeah. are la, 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 ridiculous la, 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 yeah <laughs> I'll get some in your hands. You'll love it. You'll love it. We'll take really? you in a in a in a. <laughs> uh, can they match? Dust, yes. Very can big Sony problem match the? Here. Can Sony match the 180 to 400 with the built-in to 1.4 converter? That's the question. Well, they they they. I would love for them to do it as soon as possible. But my 400 2.8 is gold. Absolute gold. Speaking of which, what lens would you what lens do you prefer when you're out on safari in the in the Serengeti and the Mara? Well, I'm very lucky to have the Nikon um, 180 to 400 f/4 with the built-in yes. 1.4 converter, yep. and I think it's quite possibly it's the most perfect perfect lens on the planet. Amazing! Yeah, thank you, Gray. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think. On that, what I want to do is run through a quick fire five questions that you can answer in one to one word to, uh, to a sentence just to okay. end the interview off. So I want to know what your favorite animal is. Mm, wild dog. 
wild dog good answer um let me just take that away then not necessarily you... the easiest to photograph obviously no definitely not definitely not if you weren't a photographer what would you be <laughs> hmm um i have absolutely no idea um <laughs> if i wasn't a photographer i would uh, i i mean i i think i'd probably like to be i think now i think i'd i don't know if i'd like to be in conservation or not because you know once you get into the management side of it it becomes very <laughs> yeah a professional <laughs> cricketer there you go thank you sis yeah <laughs> I would love to be a professional <laughs> cricketer. Unfortunately, um I'm not quite good enough. Am I Paddy? <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, or a pro tennis definitely. Okay. So, if you could make one rule for all that all photographers, wildlife photographers forever had to follow, what would it be? Have fun. Have uh, fun. Very good. Very good. Very good. I like your definitely like that straight off. Yeah. Okay. If you could keep any animal as at home as a pet, what would it be? Um, uh, pooch, you got any ideas? Um, <laughs> any any animal at home? I mean, I mean, a wild dog would be would be amazing. I mean, Besides it'd be it's great. Not. It would be great to have a bear, although it'd be a bit big. <laughs> A leopard. Yeah, a bit no, big. no constraints. Come, we're thinking outside of we're thinking outside of the box here. Yeah. yeah. A polar bear to cuddle under the cheek while you to lie on at night when you're watching yeah. TV. Yeah, I think. I think Sid. I mean, I, exercising a cheetah would be hard work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think a leopard because they lie around quite a lot, so that would be quite yes. fun. Um, I could try and train a few wild dogs to play cricket. That would also be quite fun. Definitely, cats would be awesome. Hi, JP. Awesome. Yeah. And and then and then the last question I'd like to ask: If you could choose one trip to go on anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? Polar bears. Straight up. Good polar one. bears. Straight up. So uh, anyone out there, Sid, Madhu, why don't we go and see the polar bears? We better do it. Definitely. Definitely, I think I think we just got to wait for airports to open up. That's the only problem. It's, uh, yeah. It's, uh, so, what's your, Richard? What do you reckon? When are we going to be back at work? Oh, jeez, I don't know. You know, I think Africa is a bit of a, a a hard one because of the fact that we're we're stuck in a in the deep dark Africa, and people are scared of it without any diseases going around. You think of yeah. Ebola and where it was. Um, all I can say is that I I think the African countries have reacted really well to this whole crisis and they've done amazing jobs at keeping the numbers really low as opposed to the rest of the world for the moment, at least. I mean, we, we can't jump to conclusions just yet, but I, I really hope this year we'll be able to get out into the bush. I'm missing it madly. I, I keep on telling yeah. my wife how much I wish I could go away. And she keeps she's on thinking probably, it's She's her. probably wishing yeah. you go away as well. Yeah. Mine certainly is saying, come on, it's time. It's time. You've been here now six weeks. Out. Yeah, Out. exactly, exactly, exactly. But Paul, it's been absolutely awesome having you on the, on the uh, Instagram live with me today. And I really hope that you're enjoying your time in Tanzania and that yeah. the world returns to whatever the new normal is going to be as soon as possible. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Thanks so much for having me, Richard. Thanks. And good luck with the homeschooling. <laughs> yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful day. And thanks okay, everyone. Okay, take care. Cheers. Yeah, Cheers. thanks. Bye. Bye.